Jimmy Savile went from national treasure to national disgrace overnight. The lurid stories of his sexual depravity surfaced from the murky depths of his 50-year reign over our televisions. Now seen as Britain's most notorious paedophile, the popular press described his actions as those of a monster. But was there a darker motivation for his crimes? Was Savile in fact a trans-dimensional sorcerer who harvested occult energies to feed his hunger for power? James Wilson Vincent Savile was born on October the 31st in 1926. He was the seventh son. Which in ancient folklore meant you were born with magical powers. His co-workers suspected he was a witch. As a Bevin boy, Jimmy Savile's fellow miners thought Jimmy Savile was a witch. Now then, nobody but nobody ever did eight hours down a pit and came back as immaculate as the set off with a white shirt and everything like that. <laughs> They were quite convinced I was a witch. <laughs> if you go to South Kirby now, you'll get some of the old miners when you say, Jimmy Savile's done well, hasn't he? Ah, and you look around and you'll say, he's not what you think you know. <laughs> the forces of darkness are at work there. <laughs> um, he had influence over people from all walks of life. A stray television crew, a dozen reporters, a thousand autographs. He attracts attention like a Roman candle. Jimmy Savile feeds off people. Jimmy Savile liked to mix with people from all walks of life, by day crisscrossing the country to meet the man on the street, and by night hobnobbing with the rich, famous and influential. Here are just a few of the people he knew or had associated with. The Beatles, Peter Sutcliffe, the Pope, Ephraim Katzir, Elvis, Esther Ranson, Margaret Thatcher, Ted Heath, Gary Glitter, Norman Tebbit. I remember so well you at Stoke. Diana Spencer, Prince Charles, Prince Philip, Frank Bruno, Alan Franey, and many, many, many police chiefs. Sava was also a Knight of Malta, a Knight Commander of St. Gregory, and a Knight of the Realm. Jimmy Savile seemed to know everybody, yet nobody seemed to know Jimmy Savile. Publicly, he played the part of court jester, but privately, he held an almost Jedi-like position of influence over the highest and lowest life forms of British society. What was it that made Savile so popular? Was it his looks? His wit? Or his charm? Or was it something more sinister? In October 2012, the Sunday Sport, the only British newspaper still bold enough to print uncensored stories, quoted Savile discussing how he discovered he could hypnotise girls. To demonstrate, you'll see, and choosing a girl who was already fast asleep in her easy chair, I stood behind her, passing myself off as first her mother, then her father, you'll see, and finally boyfriend. We had a lively patter going. I was convinced she was awake, you'll see, and just playing along with me. Taking again the part of her mother and asking her what she was doing in bed with all of her clothes on, sweet horror, did she not stand up, you see, and start to undress? Telling her to stop, and in the nick of time, as it had been a warm evening, she was handed to her girlfriend with instructions to be put to her bed. The next morning, you see, expecting to be denounced and dismissed, I was shattered with relief when she stood next to me in the breakfast queue and gave not the slightest sign of recognition, you'll see. Now then, years later, in the Isle of Man, I met Joseph Carmen, one of the great hypnotists. 
telling him the story, he was not surprised, you see, and suggested I should study under him and not finish up in the nick. The Isle of Man is well known as the centre of Wicca in Britain, where Gerald Gardner, the father of modern witchcraft, ran a museum devoted to the faith. What I remember so well is taking him into the Palace of Westminster. I've taken many guests in over the years, but he's the only one who was simply waved through security. He used magical signs and language. Let's analyse the phrase jingle jangle. It can be broken down into two words. Jingle, a catchy array of words in prose or verse. And jangle, which means to chatter, argue noisily or whine. Although both share the same Germanic root, jengelin, jingle evolved to mean a catchy song in an advert and jangle to mean a whiny or discordant sound. However, we have also noted the yin-yang, phonetic, abstract, onomatopoeic nature of the phrase. Jingle jangle is also an autological phrase. It describes itself. It is both a jingle and a jangle. In the occult world, language is an extremely powerful tool. Since ancient times, magic words have been used by magicians to cast spells and invoke spirits. Some are well known to us now, but others have remained obscured through the ages by the secret groups who still use them to this day. This is why we spell words. Take a word like abracadabra. Abracadabra is an incantation used as a magic word in stage magic tricks. The first known mention of the word was in the 3rd century AD in a book called Liber Medicinalis. During the Great Plague, Londoners were said to have posted the word on their doorways to ward off sickness. Alistair Crowley, the infamous magician, regarded it as possessing great power. He said its true form is Abrahadabra. So even a seemingly harmless word can have a more deep and esoteric meaning and a much more powerful and potentially harmful effect than presumed. It all, it depends, all depends on the intention. intention. When words are repeated three times, it is said to increase the effectiveness of the phrase. This is an ancient belief known to us as the rule of three. Its use is largely unconscious. We prefer things in threes. It suggests wholeness or completeness, and although it features heavily in many religious texts, it is also encoded into our modern myths. There's no place like home. No! 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 Play the Play the Put down the charm! Education, education, and education. Words. 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 There's no place like home. Now then, 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 Did Savile use this phrase to create a specific mind state in his audience? By repeating the words now and then three times, was he attempting to penetrate deep into a subconscious level of the psyche? And was he deliberately using two opposing words now and then? to further confuse and mesmerise. Once under his spell, the nation was powerless to the persuasive nature of the magician who could manipulate perception of reality for his own gratification. You could say he groomed a nation. Jimmy Savile loved the limelight and crowds loved him. Jimmy was a wonderful man. His public face is well known, but we knew him much more as an uncle. He was a very good friend. He was a very special man. You've got to go a million, billion miles to find another man like him, you know what I mean? A class amongst himself. 
but I have a magic chair that does all sorts of things. One, two, three, hey presto. Hospitals have rules with patients and things like that. Well, because I'm dyslexic when I want to be, I don't understand rules. This is Jimmy Savile's former home in Glencoe, Scotland, which was vandalised after the recent deplorable revelations about his life. Notice they call him the Beast. Alistair Crowley was a notorious English occultist wizard and founder of Thelemic Philosophy, which was summarised by the rule, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. He was also known as the Great Beast 666. The popular press of the day dubbed him the wickedest man in the world. Sound familiar? It's interesting to note the 11-pointed star design on the front of Jimmy Savile's wizard gown. This polygon is known as a hendecagram and is a central symbol, or sigil, of Crowley's Thelema religion. It is the union of the pentagram with the hexagram or the five-pointed star with the six. It represents the man-god standing face to face as an equal opposed to his creator or destroyer. It is also a symbol of the Tree of Life, the central emblem of the mystical Kabbalah. He knew everybody, you know, he toured up with the Rolling Stones, he toured with the Beatles, 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 the Beatles. It has been well noted elsewhere that many bands from the 1960s were influenced by Alistair Crowley and Thelema, including the Beatles. Here, on the cover of Hell, we see the Beatles performing the signs of the grades of Alistair Crowley's religion, A Star, A Star. It was 20 years ago today. The opening line to the track Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is said to be a reference to the anniversary of Crowley's death 20 years previously. Here's Crowley on the cover, positioned second in line to the Vedic yogi Sri Yukteswar Jiri. The Mano Cornuto, or Horned Hand, is the hand sign symbolising the pagan horned god. Here are the Beatles on a photo shoot for the Yellow Submarine album. Notice that Paul is doing the OK sign and John is doing the Mano Cornuto. In this image, John decides to stick with his horned hand gesture while Paul switches his OKs to an owl face. We'll start straight off with a letter from Winslow in Cheshire. Jimmy Savile knew the Beatles well. In the early days, he booked the Beatles when he was a club promoter. 
He then went on to tour with the Fab Four at the height of their fame, where he acted as compere and master of ceremonies. In the 1960s, Jimmy Savile and the Beatles were the British pop industry. Both helped to usher in a new era of music, Savile as DJ and Top of the Pops presenter, and the Beatles, who spearheaded the British invasion of America. If it is quite obvious the Beatles were influenced by the occult and the magician Crowley, is it too outrageous to suggest that Savile could have also been? God is the fabric of everybody's life, and God is the fabric of my life, no more religious or less religious than anybody else. So I would not say that I'm a religious man, but I do know who the boss is. Or anywhere, God is all over, not necessarily up there. If the good Lord, when he was doing his thing, if he bothered about people not seeing eye to eye with him, he would have got nowhere, and a lot of us would have got nowhere into the bargain. So therefore, you've got to square your shoulders and you've got to stand up to be counted. Mm. And you haven't really got to pay too much attention to whether people think that you're not doing the right thing. As long as your conscience is clear, then you're okay. I'm not constrained pretty well by anything. The tough thing in life is ultimate freedom. Ultimate freedom is the big challenge. Now, I've got it. And I can tell you there's not many of us that have got ultimate freedom. It should be noted that membership to a secret society in no way prevents one from entering into other secret societies. Here's our old Magus friend, Alistair Crowley, wearing the garb of two other occult groups, the mystical OTO, of which he was the head, and the Masons. Here we see the Masonic gesture for a select master Mason, the second highest known grade of this group. And here's Jimmy Savile performing the same secret gesture to those whom it concerned. By now, everybody must be aware of the use of secret handshakes in Masonic groups. Here is Savile overseeing the introduction of Frank Bruno to Peter Sutcliffe, the man prosecuted for the Yorkshire Ripper murders. Here is Crowley emulating the Osiris Slain pose, just like the Beatles on Help. And here's Savile doing the same. The Beatles famously once said they were more popular than Jesus, but the no talent Jimmy Savile achieved lasting success. He was, he was in charge. If he were here now, he'd be taking front stage. Yeah, I mean, when then, he was there, then, then. when he was there, it was like, right now, Uncle Jimmy has arrived, you see. And everyone else, <laughs> everyone else took a back seat. And we knew that. I mean, when we did that last Top of the Box, we all thought, this is a, a moment, because at the final moment, he'd done the first one. And when he turned up, we thought, the governor's here now, the gaffer's here, so you'll take a step back. As it, Uncle Jimmy is here, jingle jangle, you see, I am in charge. <laughs> and he was, and he put the light off at the end, very poignant moment. He had a wizard's toolkit. As every good child knows, a wizard isn't a wizard without a few essential props. The first is, of course, the wand. This is used to direct and focus the wizard's intention or spell. Secondly, a gown. Savile wore two different gowns, one we discussed earlier, and another which he wore repeatedly over four decades. Third is a crystal ball. Many wizards throughout the ages have used crystal balls to predict the future. Savile also had a crystal ball, as can be seen here on this auction page from the sale of his estate. Fourth is wishbone necklace. Savile wore a wishbone on a chain around his neck. The wishbone is said to represent the female genitalia, as well as being something that grants wishes. Fifth, an altar. Savile nicknamed the bed at his Round Hay Park lair, the altar, adorning it with a red satin bedspread, which had a gold stylized JS insignia embroidered into it. Sixth, he studied. The enigmatic epitaph on his now demolished headstone mentioned how he used to study books underground by the light of his miner's lamp. It doesn't take a genius to see this as symbolism for a man who was illuminated. So Savile was also an enlightened man, like many wizards. Last but not least, his rings. 
which he became synonymous with and which he shook and rattled wherever he appeared, like hypnotic charms. We'll be discussing Jimmy Savile's Rings of Power later on. Jimmy Savile was buried at a 45 degree angle, overlooking the same stretch of sea where Dracula's ship, the Demeter, washed up. Both Count Dracula and Sir James Savile were energy vampires who stalked and terrorised England, preying on young virgins. Savile's golden coffin was cast in concrete. Was this to make sure that the vampiric energy beast of the North could never rise again? Was Savile's exposure part of the great cleansing that is currently underway across the world, which Danny Boyle helped to activate with the 2012 London Olympics opening ceremony, as it was during this time the ancient Egyptian Lion's Gate? An energy transfer portal from the Sirius star system was opened to help facilitate the recalibration of theoretical spiritual energies that flow throughout the universe. Here we see the character of the child catcher terrifying children in their NHS hospital beds. Jimmy Savile has since been accused of abusing dying children in Great Ormond Street Hospital, the same hospital seen in the opening ceremony. We also see Savile in the character of Voldemort, who appeared alongside the child catcher in the Olympic mega ritual. Voldemort, the dark wizard, is dressed in the black robes that symbolize Saturn, the pagan Roman god. Let's take a look at Saturn. Was Jimmy Savile Saturn? In ancient times, the sun was seen as an invincible god who died and was perpetually reborn. But on the outer edge of our solar system, Saturn was the real king. Known as Kronos, he represented time and law. He was the agricultural god who governed the seasons. He was the Egyptian set and he is old father time. He is Satan, the devil of new religions. He is the grim reaper. Darth Vader and Pan. Saturn's day is the last day of the week, the Sabbath, meaning worship of the planet Saturn. Saturn is symbolized by the color black and the black cube. It is also the hexagon, which is a two-dimensional representation of a cube in three dimensions. In mythology, Saturn devoured his young and was also the grim reaper who, scythe in hand, took the sick and dying onto the underworld. The ancients worshipped him with ritual feasts involving all kinds of sexual debauchery. Saturn was a lot like Jimmy Savile, and the similarities don't end with their hunger for children and guardianship of the dying. Saturn is also known as Lord of the Rings, or in Latin, Dominus Analorum. And what else was Jimmy Savile but the Lord of the Rings? Here is Savile's trademark hexagon ring. The first ritual in Alistair Crowley's Rites of Eleusis is the Rite of Saturn. Crowley believes sexual depravity led to illumination. It was an essential part of the occult rituals he taught worldwide. Was Jimmy Savile some kind of energetic reincarnation or an archetypal personification of the god Saturn? And did certain people knowingly worship him as such? In all his years in the music industry, why do we never see Savile flashing the Mano Cornuto? Was the Mano Cornuto introduced into pop music as a tribute to its creator? The horned god Saturn, lord of the rings and devourer of the young? One national newspaper reported that Savile had been involved in satanic rituals in the basement of Stoke Mandeville Hospital. The participants were masked, a requirement during A-star, A-star rituals, and chanted Ave Satanus, which means Hail Satan, at the cloaked master of ceremonies, the unmistakable Jimmy Savile. But what if the chant was instead Ave Saturnus, or Hail Saturn? Ritual satanic abuse 
might be a fiction, it might not. But what would be so unusual about Saturn-worshipping cults? The Egyptians, Greeks and Romans had them. Crowley was obviously part of one. Why not Jimmy Savile? You know what I mean? He was a very special man. You've got to go a million, billion miles to find another man like him, you know what I mean? A class amongst himself. Jimmy Savile compared himself to the great and wise king of the Hebrews, Solomon. Most people want one wife. I quite fancied having a thousand, like King Solomon. John Lennon also referred to Savile as King Solomon. And John comes and sits down and says, all right, King Solomon, what are we doing wrong? Considering Savile's diplomatic mission advising the Neset in Israel, who else shared this view? Solomon first appears in the Old Testament as the wealthy, wise and powerful son of King David. He constructed the first temple in Jerusalem around 1000 BC and is traditionally portrayed as an astronomer. In 600 BC, the Greeks made magical amulets and medallions invoking Solomon's name. So they must have believed him to be more than just a stargazer. 400 years later, a text written in Greek entitled Testament of Solomon claims Solomon was given a magical ring by the Archangel Michael that would allow him to control and command the demon race known as the Jinn. The Jinn are a race of half men, half angels. The first of whom, the Jan, were created 60,000 years before Adam. Amongst their rank are the Ghouls, the Merida and Beelzebub. He used the captive jinn to build the first temple of Jerusalem and later to kidnap 500 potential wives from all over Europe for the king's famous unquenchable appetite. From the canonical and homogenized biblical account of Solomon, he is a mere astronomer who just happens to have wealth, power, wisdom and 700 wives. From the unofficial historical records, however, Solomon is a magician who controls demons, who are somehow responsible for his wealth, power, wisdom and 700 wives. But it's Jimmy Savile's association with the crown that is most intriguing, in every sense of the word. He appeared to have a free pass to Buckingham Palace and maintained a close friendship with two generations of the royal family. Do you have a Duke of Edinburgh's nickname is for me? Oz. Oz? Ostentatious. Oz. I don't know where he gets it from. Prince Charles once wrote to Jimmy Savile with a gift of cigars, saying, Nobody will ever know what you have done for this country, Jimmy. Surely he couldn't have been talking about Savile's charity work. Everyone knew about that anyway. And Jimmy was always known as a fix-it. He would dart here and there, making connections like a sewing machine needle, as he said. His back story for what he was doing during the war is inconsistent. He perpetuated a myth of his early life. Sometimes he was in the RAF, sometimes down a mine, and sometimes he was laid up in a hospital bed. If he was some kind of spy or fixer, secretly trained during the war, then his backstory would have to be a myth. All that we can prove is he was knighted three times and received an honorary Green Beret, one of only three given outs, the other two recipients being Prince Philip and Prince Charles. The connection between the occult and the secret services is well known and goes back to the very roots of modern espionage. In 2008, the researcher Richard B. Spence published a book claiming Crowley worked for British intelligence and his involvement during World War II with naval intelligence officer and creator of James Bond, Ian Fleming, is historically documented. And what of the connection between secret services and royalty? The secret services work for the Crown, as they say, for Queen and Country. The Elizabethan alchemist and white wizard John Dee worked directly for Queen Elizabeth as her personal astrologer and overseas agent. He signed his letters to the Queen, 007. Even further back in time we find Merlin acting as a personal wizard and advisor to King Arthur. 
Mythology or not, the theme of royalty keeping a court wizard is well documented. Magic is said to exist in two forms, black and white. Traditionally, black is seen as self-serving and destructive, whilst white is restorative and altruistic. The division is only blurred by the intention of a spell or ritual. Let me see your identification. You don't need to see his identification. We don't need to see his identification. These aren't the droids you're looking for. These aren't the droids we're looking for. He can go about his business. You can go about your business. Move along. Move along. An adept magician can flit between the two seamlessly, knowing that the universe is about balance between these two energies. Maybe Savile and Crowley were followers of a darker form of magic than Dee or Merlin, but it does not mean they didn't perform white or restorative magic too. Savile, it seems, worked tirelessly raising money for charity and fixing it for many children's dreams and nightmares to come true. Savile's charity endurance marathons were multi-purpose. They balanced his karma and raised bags of money for his many causes, which opened up doors to the sort of people his power could really help. Was Jimmy Savile gathering soul energy from the well-wishers and fans who unwittingly convened on the ancient ley lines that crisscross Britain? The St Michael Line is the name given to a prominent ley line that crosses England, from Land's End in Cornwall to Hopton on the Norfolk coast. In 1925, Alfred Watkins, an amateur archaeologist, published The Old Straight Track, in which he observed hundreds of locations around Britain where sacred landmarks or buildings such as churches, wells and stone circles appeared to be located along straight lines, forming an earth grid or energy matrix on the land. These locations were often near towns with the suffix ley, such as Burnley or Crawley, hence the name ley lines. Stoke Mandeville Hospital is sited on the St. Michael Line. Jimmy Savile funded and helped design the spinal unit where he was given his own flat, despite regulations forbidding such things. Savile was proud of his connection to Stoke Mandeville and held regular fundraisers for his beloved spinal unit, which usually involved pounding the old straight track. Stoke Mandeville is also credited as the birthplace of the Paralympics. Researcher Chris Street has spent many years mapping dozens of sacred sites in a 20-mile radius of London. His results formed a 20-pointed mandala known as the London Earth Star. It takes in such landmarks as Westminster Abbey, Tower of London, and both the Olympic Village and Wembley Stadium, with BBC's broadcasting house as its centre point. From its inception in 1967, Radio 1 was based in this building, and in 1968, Jimmy Savile, who famously claimed to have invented DJing, was employed to help subvert youth culture, along with Chris Denning, Alan Freeman, John Peel, and Dave Lee Travis. Perhaps the vibrational energy at the centre of the London Earth Star somehow helped focus the subversive doctrine of youth programming before its transmission over the airwaves to the nation's teens. The road west out of London is an ancient trackway known as the Hidden Unity Ley Line, or more recently as the A30. Its start point was the City of London and it can be followed out west passing through many interesting locations. 25 miles down the Hidden Unity Line, a roundabout in the town of Staines upon Thames is all that remains of an ancient stone circle known as the Negen Stones. A few hundred yards from the Dow site of the stones is Duncroft Manor 
the now notorious girls' school still under investigation by police into Savile's alleged abuses there. A further 20 miles along the line we find the A30 changes its name to the Devil's Highway, immediately outside Broadmoor Secure Hospital, home to notorious criminals such as Peter Sutcliffe and Ronnie Cray. Savile, unofficial entertainments officer and regular visitor to inmates at the hospital, kept a small flat on the grounds. In Glencoe, Scotland, Savile's secret lair and holiday home was located within an ancient supervolcano known as a caldera or cauldron. Here is a photo of Savile, the vampiric energy beast of the north, at Glencoe casting a spell with a wand in his right hand and in his left hand imparting magical energy into the key of the only residential property in Glencoe through the use of a magical mudra. Glencoe has also been used as a location for two James Bond films and Bond's creator, Ian Fleming, once owned nearby Dalness Lodge. Leeds the birthplace of James Wilson Vincent Savile in the north of England has long been associated with the occult and is said to have been an ancient ritual centre. But due to the increased levels of negative energy in the city, some researchers have suggested that Leeds may be in fact a hellmouth or portal to hell. It is believed that in these places the veil between our world and a hellish underworld is thinner, which can be used by a skilled warlock to channel negative energies contained within the portal. Jimmy Savile was born a seventh son on Halloween in Leeds. Was his birth the result of a carefully planned ritual to bring forth a demon into the body of a man? Incidentally, one of Peter Sutcliffe's victims was found outside Savile's Leeds residence in Roundhay Park. Six miles from Whitby, are the Ramsdale Stones, an ancient circle of which only three stones remain. According to the comprehensive blog on Whitby, The Real Whitby, Savile and his Scarborough set, known as The Club, held naked rituals in the stone circles on the moors, such as the Ramsdale Stones. As well as at an increasing number of NHS hospitals, Savile seemed to hold the position of house doctor at both Broadmoor and Stoke Mandeville. He also acted as self-styled psychotherapist for troubled girls at Duncroft. He had a keen interest in the pioneering reconstructive work of the spinal unit at Stoke Mandeville and in some of the country's most criminally deranged minds at Broadmoor. In short, he was interested in broken lives, broken spines and broken minds. Did Savile purposely single out vulnerable victims as he knew they would be easier to control and manipulate at his will? And was he also interested in repairing and rebuilding the human body and mind? Savile claimed in a recently released police report from 2009 that he paid for and opened the spinal unit and it is well known that he was given a set of keys to Broadmoor where he could come and go as he pleased. Was the placement of Stoke Mandeville, Broadmoor, Duncroft and Broadcasting House on powerful ley lines or over energy centres a mere accident? Or were they placed specifically for someone like Savile to harness and manipulate the subtle forces that flow along these lines? We know it is claimed Savile performed satanic rituals in the basement of Stoke Mandeville and that he danced naked at the mouth to hell in Leeds. Was he also utilising the negative power of serial killers and psychopaths at Broadmoor and of troubled teenage girls at Duncroft? And the biggest question of all, 
For what purpose could Savile have been using all this energy? It has been said elsewhere that he who controls the ley lines controls the land. Was Savile, the royal wizard, super spy and Solomon, Saturn incarnate, wielding this energy like some kind of Jedi or Sith and influencing not just individuals but also whole populations and world events? And was it his hidden power that prevented his arrest and enabled him to get close to such influential figures as Margaret Thatcher and Prince Philip? Savile ruled the screen in the magical age of television. He was the hypnotist in the corner of the living room, a wizard of the cult of celebrity, Uncle Jimmy, Mr. BBC. With his northern charm, he was every man, and at the same time, a fiercely individual eccentric who could eat fish and chips with the locals and have tea with the Queen in the same day. You could say it took the work of many white wizards from around the globe and their collective magical fractal cone of power that is the internet to thwart the Dark Master Savile, who famously forbade himself from entering the realm of cyberspace. Savile had the popular press under a spell, but once it was broken and the reality-bending revelations of his sordid lifestyle were exposed, they briskly moved on. Whilst the BBC were busy deleting emails and shredding their archives, the online community continued their research, reporting and presenting further revelations about Jimmy Savile's life. Since the release of the beta version of this documentary back in March 2013, the authorities have stepped up their assault on the internet. The McAlpine bait and switch blitzkrieg on Twitter, as well as David Cameron's ISP porn wall, are blatant attempts to censor and disrupt the continuing investigations into the real perpetrators and establishment figures responsible for pedo Britain, some of whom under scrutiny are members of Cameron's own political party. And the compulsory opt-out porn wall will not just prevent access to porn, but also to esoteric websites and forums such as our own and the David Icke Forum which has been instrumental in the continued research and exposure of Savile's exploits. Using state-of-the-art data analysis tools, armies of independent researchers are gathering and analysing every aspect of Savile's life. His acquaintances, cohorts and enablers alike are all being scrutinised to ascertain their involvement or complicity with Savile. The innocent ones will be weeded out and exonerated, but rest assured, the perpetrators will be brought to justice whether by the police or through trial by internet. So, as the authorities draw in their net, the net is also drawing in on them. And if David Cameron really wants to protect children and destroy the culture of pedo Britain, we suggest he starts with the skeletons in the closets at number 10, which is his lawful duty to protect the people of this country. He would do well to remember that one human brain is still vastly more powerful than all the world's supercomputers put together. So imagine what 1,000 brains can achieve, using the internet to work together. We have gathered a lot of the information in this documentary using the internet, and give nothing but thanks to the many armies of diligent researchers online, such as those at the David Icke Forum. Whilst we don't agree with everything discussed, we respect the tenacity and courage in seeking to find answers to the questions we are left with in the aftermath of a national scandal that goes to the core of society. We are Legion. The truth is out there. May the force be with you. <laughs>